Thank you. Morning, Mel. Could you just perhaps talk us through the proposals in the Health and Disability White Paper about removing the work capability assessment? We just, I mean, say I'm, I get a very bad back and don't think I can work and I want to apply for universal credit. What will the process be that you're trying to okay. move us to? Well, perhaps I just take the first part of your question first. Mm -hmm. So, what is the white paper all about? I think the white paper recognises a fundamental flaw within the current arrangements. And that flaw is that there is a very clear disincentive for somebody who's receiving disability uh, or health benefits to try work and see if they can get into work and hold down a job. And that disincentive is simply that the fear that if they go and engage uh, in, in the workforce, they get a job, and it doesn't work out, but quite possibly for perfectly reasonable uh, reasons, their condition deteriorates or whatever it may be, and they try to get back to the benefit uh, system that they were on before, that they might not be able to do that, because having worked might be proof in a sense that they're capable of working in a way that that proof didn't exist before. So what the white paper is fundamentally about is removing the work capability assessment element using PIP as the passport into a, a new health benefit within UC and therefore detaching this whole issue as to whether somebody is in work, has worked, has come not in work, moving in and out of work, whatever it may be, from the access to that benefit. And I think that could be a very, very powerful uh, change which I think and I hope will help hundreds of thousands of people be able to try work <coughs> move into work. So that's basically at the heart of it. So when we would, would, sorry, would is it, it be all right if, yeah, of I, course. Um, well, if I add... If, if Nigel's if, happy, yeah. Yeah, um, so your example of the, the person with the bad back. So at the moment, what would happen is someone would come in with a fit note from the GP and they would wait uh, for a work capability assessment and their work capability assessment would assess them and find out whether they deem them to be fit for work or not, limited capability for work, limited capability for work-related activity. Many members of the committee will know this system very well. Um, and then we um, effectively give people no support whatsoever if they are deemed to be limited capability for work-related activity. Um, and lots of people in that group never work again. Um, so, in our, under our new system, somebody comes in with a bad back, if they're already entitled to PIP, personal independence payment, we say, you will get your UC health payment, an additional payment, and you will get additional support, whether it's additional work coach time or uh, referral through to a system. And for someone with a bad back, actually it might be that the thing that they most need is, is clinical treatment to support them. Um, or the thing they most need is retraining to help them do a different type of job than the one they did before. So the, the idea here is rather than drive all the incentives to inactivity, that we drive incentives to get people the support that's appropriate for them. I mean, most of those things were the idea of the current system as well. But, it's, but I've got a new bad back, so I'm not in the system. I've not claimed PIP. I'm going to get sent to an assessment for PIP, aren't I? That's going to be the new thing. So how many people under the current regime have been found not fit for work but don't receive PIP? Is that a large number of people? Uh, yeah, so um, we're doing some more work on this um, and ministers have asked us to, um, to publish that data before the summer because I accept there's quite a lot of interest at the moment. There's, there's an enormous amount of crossover between these two groups, people who claim PIP, uh, and have been deemed to be limited capability for work-related activity and the other way around. So there's a large amount of crossover between the groups. But there are some people in that group who have not claimed PIP up till now. Um, yeah, many of those... Is it hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands? Um, so, um, as I say, we're going to do some more work on this and publish it before the summer. But the, um, the, probably the best data... To look at is the data in the, um, the parliamentary question that Tom Persglove answered at the beginning of March, which talks about 300,000 people. So there's a, there's a large number of people in that group right now. Many of those people may well come and claim PIP. Many of those people may well be entitled to PIP. We're also saying 
in the white paper that people who are in that group because they are currently undergoing or recovering from cancer treatment, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, or have a high-risk pregnancy, that we would give those people access to the UC health payment. And then the final thing we're saying, sorry, and then I will um, I'll close, um, is these people will be moved across to the new system from 2029 onwards because the way we're implementing the white paper is we'll bring forward legislation in the next parliament. We'll start with a new claims only, rolled out in a, in a geographical, gradual way, and then we will move this group from 2029 onwards. And anyone who is not entitled to PIP at the point that they move will get a cash protection, a financial protection. Yeah. Is so this actively raising the bar? Then? Because presumably there are some conditions where I don't have a disability, but I'm not fit for work, that I would get the existing extra support by being put in the not expected to work group. But I'll just. So if someone in that situation, the new regime will get less. I mean, that is what you're trying to achieve. Oh, so it's really important to be clear about this. We're not trying to raise the bar. Uh, we're not designing no, I this. Because to get the extra support, I'll need to qualify for PIP. That is not currently the case. So, as I said, many of the people who don't currently claim PIP not all, could come could come and do so. There is then a group of people who um, who have short term condition, for example, um, they're undergoing chemotherapy or radiotherapy, we've said that group of people will be um, protected. So no, we're not, we're not raising the bar. This is not about sort of saving money by the back door. This is about incentivizing work and, and removing the, and responding to the evidence that lots of people would like to try work, but are, are worried about doing so because of the way the WCA works at the moment. Have you scored this in kind of the state running is to will this cost more or less then do you, have you thought that through so over time this is intended to be broadly cash neutral um, as I said ministers have asked us to do some more work on this and to publish it before uh, broadly uh, too cash long. neutral means if some people who don't currently get PIP because they've never claimed it then get it they get a large extra amount of money that would mean that a multiple of that number of people would have to not get the not fit to work money to make that cash neutral, wouldn't they? I mean, the lowest level well, of you, PIP you, is what? There, there are some people as a consequence of the changes who are going into work, of course, yeah. and coming off the benefit. Yeah, the Secretary of State is right about this. So you've got the combination of people who would be cash protected, people who don't claim now but would claim and, and therefore would get more money, and then people going into work. You've scored all that. There's some kind of assessment. So we have so. done internal analysis on that, and what we're now doing is getting that ready to meet the external bar of external statistics, and we'll obviously um, pre-release the, not the notification before we publish that data. Then what happens to people? So you've got a very long run in of this is 2029, you're saying, before you're worried about people who are already in the system. What happens if I get called for a you know, a new PIP assessment every couple of years, so I get one of those in 2027. Does that drop me into the new rules, or do I stay in the old ones? So, um, so the way we're going to roll this out, we start from 2026 with new claims only, but we're going to do it in a geographical staged way. So it would depend if you were, which area you were in in your uh, 2027. But, yeah, some people might come in under the new rules, and then that means you automatically get your UC health payment, and you automatically get this support. Okay, can I just pick up on a point that uh, that I think um, uh, Katie has very rightly raised, uh, and that is that this is this is not being rushed. Far from it. That's so, true. I mean, you know, a lot of people say let's get let's get it in earlier, and I, I would be keen to do so. But you know, it, it requires primary legislation, which will go through the House in the next Parliament. As Katie says, it's then 20, 2026 to 29 for uh, the new claimants before we get onto the stock of the existing claimants at that moment in time in, in 2029 onwards. So there is a lot of time to consult and work around these issues over the coming years. I mean, what's the, I mean, do you worry if you're trying to get people to go back into work quite rightly in this situation, that 
I mean, did we not learn from the DLA to PIP switch where we thought because there wasn't a lower level of PIP in comparison to the lower level of DLA, we'd have a lot fewer people <coughs> basically getting entitlement to it, and that's not quite <coughs> worked out. I mean, it, in some ways, it's a good thing that people get the benefits they, that they're entitled to, and if they, they should have been having PIP all along, we probably should be going and writing to them now and saying, have you thought about claiming for PIP, by the way? Uh, but, I mean... If I'm currently relatively happy on the extra 30 quid a week, then you tell me I've now got to apply for PIP and I now get £300 a month that I wasn't getting. Isn't that going to have a sort of like rather opposite incentive for me than what you were kind of hoping yeah. so, for? So what the evidence shows is that there's a group of people who would like to try work and are worried about trying work because they're worried about um, mm. losing money. And um, what the work coaches say is that there's a group of people who, when they come into the job centre at the moment and they're waiting for their work capability assessment, they're worried about getting better, they're worried about accessing support, they're worried about trying to find work because, again, they, they want to get a particular outcome from the WCA. So that is the core of the, of, um, of the focus of these reforms. Do you not just move that concern? Because I've got a bad back. I don't think I'm fit for work. I go for my PIP assessment and they agree with me and I get PIP. And then I get all this wonderful support. I go and get a job. And then I get called back for another PIP assessment. And they say, so, Mr Mills, what do you do? I say, oh, I now work in a call centre full time. And they said, yeah, but, but two years ago it says you didn't think you were fit for work. I'm not going to be I'm going to lose PIP and I'll be losing twice the amount of money that I was going to lose before if I got the job. And I, aren't you just moving that fear just to a slightly different benefit, actually with more money at stake now? So it's really important to be clear about this. PIP is about your, your needs. It's um, the effect of your health condition on your daily life. Can you wash yourself? Can you dress yourself? Can you cook independently? It makes no judgment whatsoever on whether you can work or not. It also makes no judgment whatsoever on your income. Into an assessment. On your <laughs> Have you read the transcript of them? Yes. Um, it's, it's not about whether you can work or not. The whole purpose of PIP is about the effect of that condition on your, on your daily life. So if somebody with a bad back comes back for a, a PIP assessment in two years' time, whether they're working or not, and they've still got the same condition, they would still get the same award. You'd hope. Wouldn't you? but that's, the, that's the way the system is designed. I, mean, I think you're going to have to do some real confidence building in people mm. that actually the questions you get asked and the conclusions they draw you would not, are not materially changed if you're effectively working full-time. I, mean, I, I accept that bad back's not the best of example in this situation, but this is a pervasive fear that the way these assessments happen, that that would materially change the outcome. I, mean, I think that's the, the concern you, I, so I, I would have. I completely have. agree with you. There is, there, is, there is fear in this system. That's what we're trying to address. But the PIP assessment is not designed to be anything to do with your ability to work or indeed your, your personal income. It's, a, it's all about the, the effect that the condition has on, on you and your life. It's finally then, the Red Book has, I think, scores this as a 10 million net cost in year four and a 35 million net cost in year five. So is that kind of going, building up to a higher net cost or is that... And what's that showing us? I mean, that's, I mean so year I'm, five of that is 2028, so you'll yes, be quite well into your trials by then or your rollout. Yeah, so I believe the costs are about the additional work coach time with this group of people who um, don't currently get support and um, are, as you say, with, with the trials associated with it. Um, as I say, over time, what we're seeing is... Um, a broadly the additional work coach time neutral. is scored separately at 200 million. But the but the white paper brings a group of people, or the white paper reforms brings a brings a different cohort of people into um, into the support regime. As I say, it's broadly cost neutral over time. I, I think we can get back to you uh, on that, Nigel. I, I think if if it is of the order of 10 million or so, that's possibly to do with system changes and 
workings to yeah, tech just wondering and, when you were you know uh, uh, technology and systems reconfigurations and I would imagine it's in that area yeah 